In this video, I want to discuss some of the major blood vessels of the body. We have two arterial plaques. They're similar but not identical. So on this green plaque, I want to talk about some of the major vessels of the body. I'm going to start in the area of the heart, and I'm going to do the arterial supply first, blood leaving the heart. So from the heart, we should already know from our cardio videos, the aortic arch, and then off of the aortic arch, the brachiocephalic trunk, the left common carotid artery, and the left subclavian artery. The brachiocephalic trunk is going to ascend off toward the right where it becomes the right common carotid artery and the right subclavian artery. So right common carotid and right subclavian. The left common carotid ascends into the head and neck as well. Since we've turned this model so we're looking at the left side of the head and neck, we can follow this and it will divide the left common carotid into an internal and external carotid artery. We can't see the internal carotid artery on this model and we only see a few branches of the external carotid and the main branch I'd like to point out here is one that runs across the mandible and up into the face known as the facial artery. So not a whole lot to be seen in the blood vessels of the head and neck on this model. Now I want to go back over to the right upper extremity from that brachiocephalic trunk we had the right subclavian artery. The right subclavian artery is not very long and it does have branches coming from it, um, none on this plaque that you would be held responsible for, but as soon as we cross the lateral border of the first rib right here, we become the axillary artery. So we're subclavian artery from here to here. Then we come axillary artery. Axillary artery is the artery of the axilla or the armpit and it is the axillary artery until it passes the lower border of the teres major muscle. Unfortunately, on this plaque we don't have a teres major muscle, so we don't have that landmark. But, I can tell that it stops being axillary artery right about here and becomes brachial artery because the last branch of the axillary artery is called the posterior circumflex humeral artery. That is an artery that goes around the back side of the surgical neck of the humerus. Here is our surgical neck of our humerus and we see this vessel here going behind the surgical neck of the humerus. The posterior circumflex humeral artery, that was the last branch of the axillary artery. So we know at this point we were still axillary. Then we become brachial artery. The brachial artery travels down in the anterior arm, crosses anterior to the elbow in the cubital fossa, and then divides into a radial artery and an ulnar artery. And there are other associated branches which you will not be held responsible for. Radial recurrent and ulnar recurrent arteries and radial collaterals and ulnar collateral arteries. And technically the ulnar artery also sends off an inner osseous artery which further divides. On this plaque, what I'm concerned about as we come down is the brachial artery, divide into the radial artery, heading along the radius, and the ulnar artery heading along the ulna. They send branches that will anastomose in the hand and form palmar arterial arches. Here we depict a palmar arterial arch. There are two, a superficial and a deep. And then branches go out to the digits from there. If we look at the other upper extremity now, I'm going to follow the left subclavian to about here. As it passes the lateral border of the first rib, it becomes axillary artery. Now the left axillary artery. I know that right about here it's going to become brachial artery because this again, going posterior to the surgical neck of the humerus, is the posterior circumflex humeral artery. So at this point we are now brachial artery passing anterior to the elbow and the cubital fossa branching into the radial and ulnar arteries. But on this side of the model, we have pronated the forearm, so we lose our relationship between radial and ulnar arteries at this point. So I would only take it down to about this level for this left upper extremity. So those are the vessels that we sh should find on the plaque for upper extremities. Um, we've already covered quite extensively what's going on in the thorax. Um, as far as pulmonary arteries, pulmonary veins. So I want to go into the abdominal region. The abdominal region, we're going to see the abdominal aorta, the descending aorta went through the thorax, but we don't get to see it here, passed through the diaphragm at the T12 vertebral level and became abdominal aorta. The abdominal aorta has both paired branches and unpaired branches. 
The paired branches supply mostly the muscle walls, with a few exceptions, and the unpaired branches supply the viscera of the abdomen. At T12, we see two things happening here on this model. It really looks like one. This vessel is branching from the aorta and coming up onto the bottom of the diaphragm. There should be two of those, one to each side. This is called the inferior phrenic artery. The next vessel comes out and it's called the celiac trunk and it branches into three branches. And we can see those three branches here. We can see the splenic artery heading over here to the spleen. This branch is called the left gastric artery. And the third branch is the common hepatic artery going to the liver. So here we had inferior phrenic. This other one that branches into three is the celiac trunk, T12 vertebral level. At the L1 vertebral level, we have an artery coming out called the superior mesenteric artery. That's going to supply the majority of our small intestine and a little bit of the stomach. You'll learn that in lecture. Also at L1, we have arteries leaving the abdominal aorta going into the kidneys, those are the renal arteries. Then we continue down at L2, we have two arteries leaving either side, those are the gonadal arteries going to either the ovaries or the testicles. If we knew this was a male, these would be testicular arteries. If we knew this was female, these would be ovarian arteries. At L3, we see the inferior mesenteric artery supplying the lower portion of the large intestine and then at L4, the abdominal aorta bifurcates into the common iliac arteries. The common iliac arteries then divide into internal iliac arteries, which will dive into the pelvis, and external iliac arteries, which will continue out into the lower extremity to become the femoral artery. Also on this plaque, coming from L4 straight down into the pelvis, we see what is called the middle sacral artery. From the common iliac arteries, we've seen the internal iliac and the external iliac arteries. And I said that the external iliac artery is going to become the femoral artery. And that happens when it passes underneath a structure known as the inguinal ligament. We cannot see the inguinal ligament on this model. The inguinal ligament connects from our anterior superior iliac spine to our pubic tubercle, which would be right about here. So if I drew a line across right about there, that would represent our inguinal ligament. So here would be, would be an external iliac artery. On this side of the ligament, then, we would be the femoral artery. Now, the femoral artery supplies the majority of the blood to the lower extremity. The femoral artery travels in front of the pelvis and then travels initially along the medial aspect of the femur and then we'll go through an opening in the adductor magnus muscle known as the adductor hiatus to pass posterior to the knee. When it passes posterior to the knee, it has gone through the adductor hiatus, it changes its name. So we started with common iliac, under inguinal ligament we came, became femoral, when we go through the adductor hiatus we change the name to popliteal. The popliteal stops being popliteal when it branches into two branches the anterior tibial artery and the posterior tibial artery. Now the anterior tibial artery is going to pass lateral to the tibia and then run down the anterior aspect of the leg as anterior tibial artery and then out onto the top of the foot as the dorsalis pedis artery. The posterior tibial artery will send a branch out called the peroneal artery or the fibular artery. Now on this plaque, it disappears here because the fibula, you have to remember, is lateral. And we're looking at the medial side of this lower extremity. So the fibula is actually back away from us in this board. So this was the model maker's version of having this artery slowly disappear because it's getting further away from you. So this is the fibular or peroneal artery. This is the posterior tibial artery. Remember here we had anterior tibial, now posterior tibial. Posterior tibial will go behind the medial malleolus of the ankle to become the medial and lateral plantar arteries. But because we're looking at a medial side of the foot, we know this must be the medial plantar artery. So let's jump back up to where we became the femoral artery. 
femoral artery came down, went through the adductor hiatus, and became popliteal artery. Popliteal artery stopped when it became anterior and posterior tibial artery. But we've missed a whole lot along the way. Near the hip, there's a whole lot going on with this femoral artery. At the level of the pectineus muscle, we see a lot of branching going on. One branch that leaves the femoral artery will dive deep into the muscles, and that is this branch right here. It is called the deep femoral artery, also known as the profunda femoris. And it terminates as what are called perforating branches. And on this model, we can see one, two, perhaps three perforating branches of that profunda femoris, or deep femoral artery. Also, at that same level, we're going to send out two branches from the femoral artery, the lateral circumflex femoral artery and the medial circumflex femoral artery. The lateral circumflex femoral artery will branch into three branches and it passes anterior to the femur. So we know from following these branches here, this is coming anterior to the femur, so this is our lateral circumflex femoral artery. On this model, they only depict two branches, the descending branch and the ascending branch. They do not have the third branch. But we know that this must be the lateral circumflex femoral artery because it's coming anterior to the femur. This other branch here is looping, and then we can see it passing posterior to the femur. That is this artist's representation of the medial circumflex femoral artery. So to recap, femoral artery, deep femoral or profunda femoris, lateral circumflex femoral artery coming anterior to the femur, medial circumflex femoral going posterior to the femur. And then we followed the rest down through this extremity. Let's hop over to the other extremity here for just a second. Here we see the femoral artery and in this model they've cut that femoral artery so we can see those better see the lateral and medial circumflex femoral arteries. But here we can see the femoral artery passing on down, and it's actually going to disappear behind the knee. Remember, we go through the adductor hiatus to go posterior to the knee. So back in here, where we can't see it, it is popliteal artery. Now again, we don't get to see the other branches from this view, except the anterior tibial artery, which we saw on this side, now comes in between the tibia and the fibula to travel down the anterior aspect of the leg and out onto the surface of the foot as the dorsalis pedis artery. Now there are other branches along the way, but we will not hold you responsible for them on this model. Now I want to go back and look at the veins on this model. Veins generally mimic arteries, but not in all circumstances. So I want to start back at the heart where we know that we had the superior vena cava coming into the right atrium, the inferior vena cava coming into the right atrium, and the pulmonary trunk coming out. Now it's not a vein, but remember it's blue here because it's carrying deoxygenated blood. Now I want to focus on head and neck and upper extremities. Here we have the jugular veins coming down to the brachiocephalic veins. We have an internal and external jugulars. But mostly I want to focus on this upper extremity. This shows the superficial veins of the upper extremity, and they're fairly important because of uh, phlebotomists drawing blood, um, giving blood, blood transfusions, blood donations. I'm going to start near the wrist, and notice here this is an anterior view of this right upper extremity. We have a vein that starts in the hand and runs along the ulna and it's going to pass all the way up along the medial side of the forearm and arm to enter into the brachial vein. Now the brachial vein mimics the brachial artery but on this model it's been cut off right here. This vein running up along the medial side of the forearm and arm is known as the basilic vein. So here's the basilic vein and this is a subcutaneous vein and it's going to drain into the brachial vein. On the more anterior and somewhat lateral aspect of the forearm, we see what is called the anterior median vein of the forearm. And it travels upward near the cubital fossa. Now, more posteriorly and lateral on the forearm, 
we can see another vein, which was actually down here lower, but the artist version, we just start to see here, travels up and along the lateral anterior aspect of the arm and joins into the junction very near either the axillary vein or the subclavian vein. That is known as the cephalic vein. So here's our basilic vein. Here is our cephalic vein. And there's a lot of different patterns going on right here at the elbow. So it's very important for phlebotomists to know the different patterns so they know which vein they can, they can uh, enter to draw blood. But on this particular model, what we see is that this median or anterior median vein of the forearm comes up and it can branch. The branch that heads over toward the cephalic vein is, or excuse me, to the basilic vein is called the median basilic vein. The branch that heads over to the cephalic vein is called the median cephalic vein. So again, here is our basilic vein, our cephalic vein, median basilic vein, median cephalic vein. The basilic vein will enter into the brachial vein. The cephalic vein goes higher and enters either into the axillary vein or into the subclavian vein. Then we pick up the jugular veins and we have the brachiocephalic vein from the right, brachiocephalic vein from the left, forming superior vena cava going into the right atrium. The abdomen is a little bit different. If we look at the venous supply in the abdomen, we can see that this inferior vena cava is actually coming up through the abdomen. Remember that we have started near the feet with the venous drainage and we're going to bring the blood up from the lower extremities through the abdominal cavity, through the inferior vena cava to the heart. So if we look in the abdomen, we can see that the inferior vena cava is traveling upwards inside the abdomen and it's going to pick up various venous drainage along the way. Most importantly on this particular model is we can see the renal veins coming from the kidneys into the inferior vena cava. Notice those renal veins are passing on this side in front of the aorta and are anterior to the renal artery. So here we see the renal veins coming into the inferior vena cava and then the inferior vena cava going up through the vena cava hiatus of the diaphragm into the right atrium of the heart. But I want you to pay particular attention right here around the liver because here's where the abdomen differs a little bit. The liver has veins that drain into the inferior vena cava. Those are called hepatic veins. And you can see them here on blue, draining the liver into the inferior vena cava. However, in the abdomen, all your abdominal viscera, your kidneys, well, excuse me, not your kidneys, but your spleen, and your small intestine, and your large intestine, they all drain into a series of veins that will form what is called the hepatic portal vein. That takes blood from the abdominal viscera into the liver. So on this model, you can see here, it's kind of a brownish purple color. Here's the splenic vein, and here is one of the other branches of the hepatic portal vein, and yet another. All of these will converge to form the hepatic portal vein, which goes into the liver. So the vein going into the liver, hepatic portal vein, the veins coming out of the liver to the inferior vena cava are hepatic veins. Do not confuse the two. Let's go down and look at the, up, or the lower extremity for just a second. There's not a lot to see on these lower extremities. The veins are generally named with the same name as the arteries. So in this lower extremity here we saw the femoral artery. It's followed with the femoral vein. When it was popliteal artery, it was popliteal vein. The lateral and, and medial circumflex femorals have both arteries and veins. But the one big difference we see in the lower extremity, starting on the medial side of the foot and traveling all the way up the medial side of the leg, then the medial side of the thigh to join the femoral vein just before it becomes the external iliac vein is the great saphenous vein. The great saphenous vein. And this vein has many different clinical significances. I'll leave that up to your individual lecture professors. But great saphenous vein, medial side of leg, medial side of thigh,
going into the femoral vein. Now that femoral vein, as it passes under the inguinal ligament, will become the external iliac vein. There are veins from the pelvis that were internal iliac veins. Those two will unite to form a common iliac vein. The common iliac veins unite to form the inferior vena cava. So those are the veins that you should be able to see on this vessel plaque.